Welcome to Above the Garage. Hi, friends. Welcome to our third episode discussion of Shining Girls. Let's do a round of introductions and dive in. Hi, I'm Helen. Hi, I'm Ginger. Hi, I'm Kimberly. And I'm Kate. So this episode opens with Dan drunk on the train. Um, And by the way, after seeing the end of the episode, I think we know that the scene occurs after the last scene in the episode. Yeah. With Harper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The episode jumps around. Yeah. I I didn't get a full handle on that. I assigned that to Kimberly while I slept last night. The episode kind of goes in a circle with time. Yeah. We will try and discuss that accurately. So I guess he stole the keys from the fishbowl because he was at the bar watching him be crazy. Uh, But back to the train, a kid says hi to him and his mom rushes over to retrieve the kid. Probably a good idea. There's blood dripping down Dan's hand and he digs through his pocket to find a receipt from a bar to figure out what happened last night. It's a long receipt. I happened to count the drinks for fun and it was around like 33 and I was I was counting the doubles. As, I was counting the doubles as singles too. So some of those wow. are doubles. Um, I'm actually impressed he's still alive. As yeah, by my calculations, he should be dead, right? Well, amongst yeah. other things that he yeah consumed. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and he's doing coke. I wonder if people can survive that amount of alcohol. And he seems like he's got some experience. So. Yes. Yeah. He there probably is. has a very high tolerance. Yeah. Can you imagine how he like smells right now? Oh, he's so gross. <laughs> I don't even think he showers before he goes to work. Okay, whatever. Off track. So he unbuttons his shirt and he finds his injury, which looks to be a piece of glass in his arm that he tries to pick out. And he goes to the bar on the receipt, Cokey Bar. Eh, Cokey Bar, that's funny now. Uh, he's obviously a regular. And he asks the owner who's cleaning the bar if he has his keys. And he says, yeah, I took your keys. But he can't find them in the fishbowl. And when he finally does, he says they're not all there. Which I thought was funny because there weren't that many keys in the fishbowl. And he looked in there for a really long time without recognizing his keys. Um, I thought that was weird. It must be his house key, right? Or his car key? That's what I was thinking. It's his house key because that's uh, Harper's going to break in. Same as he took Jenny's. He gets to his car and he tears the parking ticket off the windshield. And when he starts the car, the music comes on really loudly. And he ejects the cassette tape and stares at it and like all around him, clearly puzzled. Because I don't think it was his tape. I don't think it was his music. The seat had been adjusted. So he was like, whoa. But I don't, Jamie Bell's not that small, right? I don't (laughs) think so. We've seen them beside each other. I think Wagner Moore is pretty tall though. Okay. There's a height differential. So then he's pounding on the door. He was pounding on the door of the bar too. There's a lot of door pounding in the show. But trying to get into his own house because, yeah, I guess it's his house that's missing. And his son, uh, who has been abandoned all night, I guess, refuses to pause the game to let his dad in. And then he finally does. And his dad comes in and starts bitching about him eating Cocoa Puffs, which I find very ballsy considering the quality (laughs) of parenting that this child is receiving. Well, considering what he just consumed last night. Yeah. I think Cocoa Puffs are okay. (laughs) (laughs) While they argue about going to school, Freddie accuses Dan of not working. And Dan says, I was at the office and I called you from there. And Freddie said, no, he didn't. And then Dan says, okay, Freddie, maybe I didn't. I don't know. Um, And initially I was like, is this his drunkenness or is his reality changing? But now I realize. Yeah, I thought the same thing at first. Yeah, but now I I think it's happening the day after Kirby and him were at the police archives. It is, yeah. So he lied to her and said he was going to call Freddie, but he actually went to drink with the cops. Uh, that's right yeah okay so then he remembers the cassette and he asked freddie if he left the cassette in the tape deck and nope it wasn't freddie and the bookshelf a number of his books have been turned sideways he puts them back uh i started to try to figure out what the books were by comparing it to an earlier shot i had a look oh perfect uh, there are two Norma Mailer books and The Turn of the Screw. Mm. And I had a look uh, about Norman Mailer and what he wrote about. He uh, wrote about psychopaths. Oh. And he wrote about how... I can pull up the quote just yeah. a second. I don't see the relevance of psychopaths to this show. Not at all. Okay, the drama of a psychopath for Mailer is that he or she seeks love, but love as the search for an orgasm more apocalyptic than the one that preceded it. Mm. Hmm. Power over bodies, societies, political entities, etc. is a constant presence in Mailer's work. His portrayal of the body are, are mostly violent. The body is an entity to be poked, prodded, broken, even snuffed into non-existence. 
So I thought those posts might be relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for looking that up. No problem. All right. So then, then they do the opening credits, and this is where I think we jump back two days. Yeah, it's two days. I think I think in the other episodes we said we were going to look at the intro and see what was in there. Well, I saw keys, Ginny's keys, uh -huh. and B, Ginny's umbrella, um, the B happy matches. The little horsey thing that Harper gave Kirby when she was little. A yeah. ribbon. I still don't know if it was a ribbon, but I'm going to okay. say it's a ribbon. Oh, a ribbon. knife. What looked like Kirby's diary, her notebook, and the radium. I think it's really cute that the matchbook appears on Twitter now when you hashtag Shining Girls. Oh, my God. It was so weird. Yeah. I thought I was pressing something wrong, and I kept, I kept deleting it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck's going on? And then I realized what it was. I mean, I like to picture you doing that like several times before you realize so it's <laughs> happening for a reason. But like, who, who yeah. does that? Who's behind that? I don't understand. Yeah, I don't know. It's good promotion, I guess. Yeah. It's cute. I like it. So Kirby's going through old articles, finding female stabbings. Wait, and... did you mention that Harper was standing outside staring? Oh, I didn't. Yeah. Before the credits. Sorry. At Freddie and Dan's house. Yes. Harper's staring in the house creepily and drinking his coffee yeah he's really good at being creepy all right so then we're back kirby's going through the old articles finding female stabbings dan's boss comes down and kirby updates her and says she's pulled 136 cases so far and abby's like dan shouldn't have brought you in and kirby's like uh he didn't this was all me i did all this before he came in so we learned she's been there for three years in october and then abby's asking about if uh dan is sober which I don't think did, she didn't answer it directly, right? But no, he's very much not sober, Abby. I think uh, Kirby was a bit surprised that Abby asked that. I think she didn't know yeah. about it, about yeah. his addiction. Because she said, You've been here long enough, you know, he took a leave of absence, but it didn't seem like they moved in the same, you know, department. She yeah. seems, yeah, department. she seems surprised by all of that, yeah. which I think is why later she kind of questions him a little bit. And the comment uh, about, um, Abby having to lock him in his <laughs> office like that was the safest place to keep him when he was like yeah that was up. crazy did she I mean know. like when he was drunk or like angry I think drunk I, I don't know I'm, how he experiences that drunkenness yeah. but having to lock someone in a room is pretty wild especially at, especially work. at work yeah <laughs> which is interesting though because he's sitting now he's sitting like in a little desk in the middle of the office so he has no mm -hmm privacy yeah. no door nowhere to lock him in it's just shocking that he's the parent with custody right somehow that his freddie's mom is worse than, than dan how is that i possible? thought about that because he said she's an addict yeah, among other things <laughs> what are yeah. those things i don't know poor kid but he's doing pretty well it seems for himself yeah. anyway so i was looking really hard for a desk calendar in the office because there's like a million desks and i feel like there had to be a desk calendar to help me confirm the date but all I could actually confirm is that Dan's watch is like eight hours off, 10.15 versus 2.05. <laughs> uh, I have an estimate on the date. I think it's uh, the 20th of April. 1992, right? Yeah. It starts on April 13th. And I thought it was all kind of packed in the one five-day week, work week. I don't know. Why did you think April 20th? Uh, because it follows episode two that, in my notes, ends with April 19th. It does. Okay. You saw uh, not the Dan and the, uh, and the L, but uh -huh. the two days before it would be the 20th. And then in the L would be the 22nd. Okay, so it's over two weeks then. All right, so I, I only started my like trying to figure out the date in this episode and I didn't go back very well to those. So uh, I have question marks yeah. <laughs> next to every <laughs> date. It's just uh, approximate. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we'll crack it though. <laughs> Got it. It also made me think about like clocks and filming. It must be like really hard for continuity to, I guess, just stop the clock. Maybe if you're filming multiple scenes. Yeah. There's just so many like random details in making TV and movies that I never really thought about. Well, she said for this show, I mean, they had to take meticulous notes on continuity because yeah. they've because the timeline's so crazy, and then they had to film out of order. Uh huh. Oh, the man. locations and all that. So, <laughs> be so confusing. So she takes her 136 cases up to Dan, and she's acting really strange about talking to him in the office. Like she's not allowed to. She's like looking around her and like, okay, I'm gonna go for it. But uh, I think that's because she's his source. 
everybody to know she's his source. Abby knows she's working with him, so. Yeah, but I don't, I think like her job is to basically just give people their information, not help him like crack the case, you know? Right. Anyway, he tells her it's too many cases with too little information um, because they're all like blurbs and she insists that's why she needs the police reports for all of them and suggests taking a little um, answering machine tape to the police and he's like, they're not going to like that. They don't like you and you stole it. So, Uh, So then they leave the office and go to the police archives. But on the way, she asks him why he took a leave of absence and she's visibly disappointed when he lies to her and said, I wanted to spend more time with my son. Uh, not very believable at this point. Well, yeah, and I, there's definitely more to that, which obviously I know they'll get into because he said to her, whatever Abby told you, it's not me. Right, which I think is just double da- doubling down on the lie to me. But I maybe. think it could be, but I also think there's something more going on that he probably didn't share with anybody. Kind of like how Kirby has stuff going on and she doesn't really talk about mm-hmm. it with anybody. I have a hunch there's going to be like a little parallel there somehow. Like whatever happens mm-hmm. in his story might correlate to hers which maybe that's why he's more willing to hear her out and listen to her whereas nobody else really does and she like fairly says i've told you everything you've asked i thought you would do the same and she's disappointed and he asked if abby's checking up on her and she's like yeah but that's not why i wanted to know i i like her honesty there she's being totally honest about everything that she can so then they go to the police archives and she's warned that the barrels of physical evidence are off limits. Um, they started going through the files or crossing off anyone eliminated. And then it flashes from Kirby and Dan reading the files to Harper reading the paper in a convenience store. A young woman with a fake ID is being turned down at the counter and she sees Harper and asks him to buy the beer for her. He tells her to go through the side door and steal it, um, that he's going to drop quarters that can cover for her. And that happens like immediately. Does he just really like go back to these days over and over and over again? Yeah, this one, doesn't he say he's um, he's never seen her before or hasn't noticed her there before? Yeah, we, I, w- I was thinking about that because I have a theory that I'll, we'll, we'll get to when we get a little bit more into this scene. I yeah. do think that he revisits these scenes many times. Yeah, I mean, he had to for like the Polaroid picture one with yeah. Julia. Um, so Harper follows her into the back and she isn't a, like a fraction of as weirded out as she should be. In my opinion slightly more weirded out as he follows her through the back room towards the door he claims will drop her on the street finally she realizes she's trapped and she threatens to scream and he says go for it you're the one stealing the beers and she offers him money he doesn't want it he just wants to talk about her bad choices why did you let me follow you you didn't want to keep walking but you did we talked about this a little in episode two when somebody's acting really weird around you you still kind of try to normalize it i think his words though are really important in this scene because i i actually kept rewinding it because first of all i couldn't understand them so i put the, the captions on but he says why did you let me follow you and then he says not exactly where i told you to go so which makes me yeah. think like he is reliving these scenes and he's like mm-hmm. It's like he specifically wants these girls to do something. Because I, I felt feel like, like it was almost too easy for him. She just <laughs> didn't really think about it. She just yeah. kept walking when he was following her. So it's yeah. almost yeah. like he he was like, maybe I'll he's try like, again later. Yeah, he's like frustrated with her, which makes me think like he either has expectations or he, he just wants them to do something in a particular order or a particular way. Yeah, he says um, it should have taken us years to get here yeah and i thought uh okay so he wants the challenge or wants the girls to be something that they're not yet and maybe yeah. he kind of tries to influence them and also, he's disappointed yeah. he says you can't even find a door why would i follow you any further you're too stupid to kill you now that's how i took yeah. it yeah that's how i took it too i think he or always you likes yeah. the them being more like Oh, what's the word like strong like with um julia the one that got yeah. murdered last episode she was more starting you know, before, to shine yeah before she started to get stalked she was okay with herself she like when harper went to her and touched her hair she was like no you know yeah mm. get away from me you know she yeah. doesn't seem kind of phased by it confident yeah yeah and, yeah and he, he says to this girl like you kept walking even though you didn't want to and he seemed mad about that so like she wasn't strong enough to be like look dude don't follow me or because honestly yeah. I said that I, I was thinking about that and I'm like if this were me and I don't know this guy and we're in a back room I wouldn't be the one walking first if he's telling me that's where the door is yeah. I'm like sure I'll follow you you know so I think that he's just irritated that she's not vocal enough to defend herself I would have given up that six pack and retreated 
Yeah. <laughs> but I, this is kind of where I have my theory. So I feel like, cause I know we talked about this a little bit, like, the shining girls, right? We're not, we haven't really gotten into yet. Like why exactly they're called the shining girls. Right. I was going to say outside of interviews, that's the only. Yeah. Yeah. So my theory is that he's tracking these girls and he's waiting until they shine to make their move. And I think that's why so far with these women with um, Ginny and Julia and this woman, I feel like they're showing us different parts in his journey with them. So like for Julia, we saw a lot of like, we kind of saw her when she was shining and then the end of her life, like when he eventually murdered her, it seems like we kind of saw her shine, but then we see him stalking her and she's, she's not shiny anymore because he's breaking her down and dulling her shine. Mm-hmm. And then he kills her. And then like with Ginny, again, I feel like we're kind of seeing her shine as well, but there's got to be more to her story because obviously they're coming back to that one. And then like with yeah. Kirby, with Kirby, we're seeing her after the fact. We haven't really seen anything yet on her before her incident with him. So I feel like with her, we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing what's happening now. And she's, as far as we know, she's the only survivor. And then with this woman in the store, she's not shining yet. So it's kind of like showing like his process on, I don't know if he's guiding her or he's just, he's not happy with the fact that she's not shining the way he wants her to. I didn't even yeah. necessarily feel like she was a target of his. So I don't know. That's yeah. There's so, so many I, ways he can can interpret it. Right. Just, I know. Yeah. So, and I, I'm just wondering if that's what this is really happening. And then eventually, because we see more episodes, they'll like tie it all together more. Will they shine more? I feel like I need to see the woman shining a bit more. Yeah, and that's why I like think they they're were... showing different pieces. Because, like, I feel like with Ginny, like, we're kind of seeing her shine, like, at the end of the episode when she's doing, like, her speech, her uh, shows. But mm-hmm. I don't feel like we've seen enough of the shine, like you said. I think maybe it has to do something with uh, how powerful they're getting or how um, uh, in, in the society that they're in, that they're gaining more power because of uh, the positions that they have. Uh-huh. Uh, so Julia, is, she's like a veteran, uh, yeah. how do you call it? Counselor. Or something. Counselor. Yeah. Yeah. And she's, I don't know, self-assured. Yeah. Is that the word? That's a good word. Yeah. So maybe this is what he sees as shining, someone who is totally control uh in in their over their own life Mm -hmm. and they're succeeding and he becomes jealous of that or this is the the shine that has to be taken away so they can't go any further Further. than that yeah yeah so kirby and dan are still going through the files and finally kirby finds one willie rose with the same cuts as hers and they look for what he might have put in her and they find a gold pen this murder was from over eight years ago. And so they realized there must be more and they're like super motivated again. And they get Catherine Moore, Margot Margo Zell, Karen Polachek, Summer Francis. And then when Dan gets up to quote unquote, call his son, Kirby finds her file. Sharon Leeds. I couldn't quite make out the, the full date. I saw May, maybe 18th. I'm not sure, but May, 1986. And it flashes to Harper stalking Dan's son. And they're at a, Hispanic market and he claims to have worked with Dan at the Observer Uh, and then Harper follows him outside of the store and asks the kid if he's if Dan's told him about Julia the dead girl and I enjoyed the kid's response no he doesn't talk to me about dead people and he says imagine what else he's not telling you about and gives him a Kit Kat puts it in his pocket tells him not to don't take candy from strangers kid that's right (laughs) to our kid listeners out there first rule of parenting isn't it (laughs) (laughs) I have a little comment or i don't know for the scene before when they are at the archive uh-huh. the police archive didn't you find it jarring how long the scene was i actually timed it and it's over two minutes of oh, them right. looking af- at the pictures uh-huh. mm-hmm. and it's two minutes of this mangled bloody yeah. women's yeah. bodies and all the cases that haven't been uh, solved i found it really really jarring that there are that there were so so many that many yeah yeah, yeah, and then and then the scene was probably meant to slap us in the face with that that there are so many women that right. nobody cares about. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just the fact that she found 136 cases too. It is really sad. Yeah. Um, Dan, who left to call his son, right? No, he's drinking something in a paper bag with a group of cops. <laughs> 
kind of looks like a makeshift bar in the archives. Well, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> and he returns looking for Kirby and he's getting more and more worried as he calls her name and, and, and she doesn't answer. But finally he finds her in the off limits area with her crime evidence on the floor at her feet. He's, he says he has to go home and tend to Freddie and she puts everything else back, but she tries to take the matchbook with her and says, you know, he put it inside of me. It belongs to me. And he convinces her to leave it um, like very like compassionately saying, yeah, there will be a trial and you want that there. Then you can have the matches to light your cigarettes. Um, yeah I love how he calms her down just by being rational and putting everything in, in perspective it reminds so me why of someone yeah, yep. exactly. <laughs> did you yeah, notice that like, when um Lizzie or Kirby said it's mine like it sounded exactly like June and I swear she said that on Hermes Tower and I just flashed to, it's yeah. mine <laughs> it's mine but he is similar um to Nick in that way yeah because yeah. it's all about the delivery too and he said it very gently like yeah. mm-hmm. if he said that more harsh obviously it wouldn't have landed but like he had compassion which it doesn't seem like a lot of people are giving her this yeah, she's a police officer yeah I and then she's the back like, the tear that was she's got the really, june single to you yes <laughs> but it's but it's so effective because it was just like my heart broke for her you know i know i know i like that scene between them a lot i like their yeah. relationship so then there, and she also is like, she's like, can we work at your place? And he's like, no, let's leave it tomorrow. And she's like, okay. Like she's very, she goes along with whatever he's saying. No, but she's like, I'll do it on my own. Yeah. Because he said no. Like friendly so she's, about it. I don't know. Something about it I liked. And he's like, she okay, has that, like, fine. Gonna ask you. Yeah. And he's like, okay, we, we can do it. I'll he almost doesn't, he doesn't want her to do it on her own, I don't think. Right. Because obviously he didn't really want her to come over and do it at his house. But when she said she was going to do it at her house alone, he was like, okay, come over. I've got bananas for you. Bananas and beer. (laughs) Did did he offer her tea or did she just ask for tea? He offered offered. Oh, okay. I was like, I wouldn't have thought he had tea. (laughs) He did. He did not have tea. (laughs) So they go home and his son's lying about playing video games, but uh, Kirby helps cover for him and says, I don't think the TV's that hot. So boy likes her immediately. Oh, Freddie mentions that he ran into some weird guy Dan used to work with and his dad's like, take notes, take names. You got to build habits now for a Dan officer, a banana and a beer. And reminds her she should probably call Marcus. And hilariously, she's like, nah. And he's like, no, really, you probably should. <laughs> uh, she does not think of Marcus at all. And I get that. That would be weird. And she finds a picture of Freddie's mom and says, Freddie looks more like Dan. He, she asks, I think, if Freddie and his mom get along. And he says that he adores her, but she's an addict, among other issues. Poor kid. His parents. Yeah. Not, not a good combo. And then this part where, so she asks if she's around and he says no, and he says, no, she has to keep her distance. And Kirby asks if that's what he wants. And is this flirting? Is she flirting with him? Is she like trying to find out if the woman's in the picture? Because then Dan says, it doesn't go too well when we're together. So we're not. And then he says, reminds her where the phone is to call her husband. I thought that was pointed though, that he said, call your husband. So I feel like. It's like in Handmaid's Tale when Rena says, ask your wife. (laughs) So then they're going through the women, trying to find their current contacts, and he finds her journal, which, yay, she finally listened to me, and she's carrying it with her, instead of counting on it being under the bed. <laughs> choice, Kirby. Uh, and he's like, your address, Marcus's name, his age, your bus route, and he reads through the notes. Oh, I read through some of the notes. My favorite is James, who is unhappily married, hates his kids, hates baseball, lives in Wrigleyville, but does not get the joke. Wrigley is the Cubs baseball stadium, by the way. And she also has notes on the party stuff that she was supposed to pick up. So what, hap- what happened there? The notes are changing now without her changing them? Because her apartment didn't change until she walked in after Jin Suk's murder. So if the notes are writing themselves, what good does it do? I think it's because the time is jumping around. So like uh, she must have already jumped to maybe where she was supposed to buy the party stuff, maybe after. But she was completely baffled by the party. So I don't understand. I don't know. I think it's hard because the time it's is just jumping. It's so hard to figure. Yeah. Yeah, because I can't tell if the time is jumping randomly or like, are we going to keep going back and forth or are we going mm-hmm. forward? I think there is a scene in um, episode one when Kirby says to her mom that it starts with little things and then mm-hmm. there are bigger things that change. I think 
the party is the big thing that has yeah. changed and the other smaller things that are happening all around there are the, the small things that are not really time and, jumping uh-huh. but just little shifts in the reality but the big things and, they have to do probably with harper and the murder because it's right. exactly at least shown in the show that it's the night that Jeannie is killed, is killed yeah. but she is here in the scene a week later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in this episode a week later. So it's probably a time jump again. So right. I got absolutely confused, but I think <laughs> that it has to do with the little things and the big things. Okay. I don't know. The notes are probably the big things. Right. Yeah. And the big change did happen. Like you said, when Jenny, when he killed Jenny, that's when her apartment changed to a whole different floor and now she's married and big change so So, harper's actions are probably causing quick aside helen has read the book right yeah and then ginger i know kimberly hasn't did you ginger i have not i do like that mix a lot all right but back to sorry so they're talking he's he's like found the notebook dan's found the notebook he's upset because it doesn't make any sense um and she says i take notes same as you he's like no these aren't notes they're basic facts that you already know i'm in here you have a log of every conversation that we have and he gets angry and he's demanding to know why she would need this and she explains that when she got out of the hospital everything was different and she needed a way to help her navigate and then he gets like compassionate again and he's like and you still feel lost and again i really like the scenes between them Uh, i think he feels her vibe he, yeah, he, he looks at her and realizes that not to go further right and he listens to what she says he's not stuck in in his own idea well you should be done with your trauma because it's six years later but when she says i'm not done with mm-hmm. dealing with it he's okay then let's move on so this is all that he needs he doesn't need to push himself onto her and expect her to be done with this And he does that regularly when she's not answering things to his satisfaction, but he lets it go because he can see that she's like upset and she's trying and he's like, okay, then uh, what can you tell me that will corroborate? Yeah. Yeah. I really like that about him, but I really like what you pointed out that he really listens. He's not, most people, when you argue, you're thinking about what you're going to say next and what you're going to scream at. Exactly. You don't really. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's also um, kind of like society expects uh, trauma victims to be done at yes. some point in time like move on for six years yes mm-hmm. six seven years after <laughs> it's like can we be done with that and can you be a normal person again and the answer yeah. is no yeah yeah i think it's significant too though that he's a reporter because a reporter's job is to listen mm. and and he's listening to he's, her and like he is great at listening <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so like she's showing her vulnerability. He's reading that, he's listening, and then he's he knows when not to push or when to right. just let go. Which she's reacting compassionately. Yeah, and sh- I think she starts trusting him more as well because with every that. next step because of that. Because she sees that he is not um, talking her down about it. And I think that's probably a little bit of a comparison to Marcus because he's. He's not really pushing her either, but his tone and the way yeah. he's coming across, though, I, I feel like he doesn't seem very empathetic. He's not like Dan definitely is compassionate, whereas Marcus is yeah. not. Well, that's, that's what he like, said in the car, wasn't it? Yes. He said all decency, no, no compassion. No compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Which then, obviously, like, you're going to you're going to open up to somebody who's showing you that they care. And if somebody is their words sound compassionate, but their tone and their actions do not, then you're not going to open up to them. Oh, he also says when they are in the projector room, uh, looking at the pictures, he is kind of pissed that Kirby is uh, doing research on her own case with Dan. And he says, we've been already through that. So in Marcus' mind, they're done with the trauma trauma. and and let's move on. And uh, for Dan, it's probably first time listening to what Kirby has to say. Uh, so he shows definitely more compassion than, than Marcus, who is probably has a couple of years of dealing with this trauma behind him. Right. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to tell since we don't yeah. even know when they got married. All right. So he is being nice again. And the, she puts her hand out and he hands her the book. And he's 
again compassionate and he says this investigation can't be making it easier and she says it does because she's going to be thinking about it no matter what and now this gives her a reason to which reminds me of us in the podcast anyway uh <laughs> he gets back to the case and they all had similar wounds all around the same age no witnesses and he left something inside of all of them Anne had a devotional card karen the button julia the radio and she's like that's enough for an article and he disagrees I noticed something about all of those um, items. I believe they are all gold, correct? The pin, the radium, the matchbook are gold. Is the, the devotion card, I didn't get a chance. Did they show that? I don't think so. I don't know. But it, seem, it seems like everything is gold. There is what about the key? Yeah. He's probably so, gold, yeah. Well, so then it makes me think, well, then like even the radium is like a gold color. And then this is called the Shining Girls. So mm-hmm. I feel like the gold is going to have something to do with this, maybe. Good observation. Yep. So they need to find surviving family members because they're not supposed to have the police records. So they need more information found elsewhere. But he said it's enough to get started and he's going to take it to Abby tomorrow morning. They haven't figured out what Harper left with Summer Francis. So then Kirby wakes up at Dan's and you can tell it takes her a second to remember why, because I'm sure she initially thought her reality had just changed again. And she comes in the kitchen. Did you guys notice what kind of sandwich Freddie was making? No. A potato chip sandwich. Just bread and oh, potato yeah. chips in the middle. <laughs> that sounds delicious. Yeah. It is amazing. Do you know what's really good? Barbecue chips. With oh, a no. Bit of oh, no. I don't like barbecue no. chips. Mm, with, with butter? butter? No. Yeah, butter on the bread. No. Wait, and <laughs> then barbecue chips in the middle? Yeah. So you've actually had a chip sandwich. Yeah, and all like do you know what Wotsits are? You might not. They're like an English chip that Dave introduced me to. And I've, it's like, um, they're kind of like um, cheese whirl things. Uh-huh. Um, and you put Philadelphia on the bread and then you put them in the middle. Mm. Oh, my so God. Good. No. <laughs> you should try it one time. Seriously, try it. It's so good. Uh, I'm going to send you all Vegemite to try. There you go. Mm. I've had Vegemite when I was in Scotland. That's Yeah, but I bet you tasty. tried it wrong. <laughs> how should i have you tried can't it? have a bloody spoonful of it how do you eat it okay <laughs> it's a process you have to toast the bread really well and then literally as it's right out of the toaster you put the nice butter on and then like it's melting and then you get the tiniest bit of vegemite and you literally put it on the top like you don't scrape it on you like delicately put a tiny bit on and then it's good this is just one piece of bread? <laughs> yeah. You turn it into a sandwich. No, just one piece of toast. Like a piece of toast with like peanut butter on it. You know what when I mean? You, but with when, veggie butter. Um, where were we? <laughs> Chip sandwiches. Oh, so it was relevant, I see. Um, well. All right, so he's making this potato chip sandwich with murder photos all over the table. And she looks alarmed. Like she's already a better parent than his parents. And starts to clean them up. And he says, I've seen worse. The kid is experiencing no parenting at all. But again, I think he's doing pretty well with himself. I noticed in the scene too, you can hear barking dogs. Oh, really? Which probably <laughs> means something. And it just reminds me of The Handmaid's Tale because there are always barking dogs in the Gilead yes. scene. Uh, and they have coffee together. It's super cute. And then Dan's talking to Abby and uh, she's excited. She wants to give him a Sunday series. Uh, she wants to let the police know so they don't, to give them time to save face with Pavel. But she wants to start with his source. And she's like, come on, Dan. And finally, he tells her it's Kirby. And how do you make such a colossal fucking mess of everything? And she's all upset. But she calms down pretty quickly. And he says, like, she won't be in the article because she's been through so much. She had to change her name already. And Abby points out that a survivor hunting a serial killer is the story, you know, the best version of your story. So then... We're with Marcus and Kirby, and he brings her clothes to work, and he's still acting cool. I thought that was nice. Yeah, he thought about bringing her clothes. He's doing all the right things and saying all the right words, I think, but or for the most part, but there's something wrong with his tone and uh, the emotions are not there. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's like empty. I don't know. It's weird, and he's not happy that Dan has just folded her in on all this. She wants to look at some negatives from a guy that died. And Marcus is like grilling her. How is this from 20 years ago? How is this background? 
So she finally tells them they think that this might be the same guy that almost murdered her and it gives her like a look and it's like, and you and Dan worked all of that out. So she's trying to find a closer picture of the woman who they don't know which object is in her, uh, Summer Francis, I think. Yeah. And Marcus is stunned when he sees the woman is cut up just like she was. She did mention her career too. She said she was a structural engineer. So I wonder if that's, sign- I wonder if their careers are significant as well. Like that's, that's pretty successful. You know. I don't think there are, were so many women in this uh, field in the 90s. Right. The, Same. No, no, yeah. it was the 90s. It was uh, 1972. Was, yeah. Was definitely not. That's notable. You're right. And Marcus wants to know what the cops said. And she's like, um, well, they didn't find any of this. I did. And he's just, I don't know. He's like, is it just you and Dan pulling shit from storage? And she says, no, this is us breaking a story. He's just being demeaning, I guess. Dan does not have a good reputation. But no, Dan does not have a good (laughs) reputation. I think he's worried about her because she spends, it seems like she spends a lot of her time on this. And then she's also working with Dan who doesn't have a good reputation. So I think, Mm -hmm. I think he probably is genuine in his worry, but again, it just, it falls flat. Like it doesn't come across as empathetic. It comes across more as, I don't even want to use the word controlling, but I guess. He wants to know. Maybe not control, but he wants to know what she's doing with Dan. And he also, I guess it rubbed me a little wrong when he's like, we worked so hard to get you like past yeah. this or something. Yeah. When in fact, it's her that has to do all, all this, you know? I, I don't know. Yeah. Like he's annoyed that she's going back into. You'd think he'd be pretty happy though, like trying to find um, someone or the guy that did it to yeah. her. Yeah. Um, because and other that people. Would be enormous closure, right? I mean, again, it's not going to solve everything, but it would help a lot. So you would think that he would want to help, not discourage it. But maybe he's more of the mindset of leave it to the police to do. Move on. Yeah. (laughs) We talked in the last episode, I think, how shit the police were, didn't we? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) They're horrible in this story, not everywhere but they just want a suspect. They don't care who it is. They just want the case closed, you know? And they don't seem to care about the victim. Uh, In fact, they treat her pretty shitty. So I would be annoyed if he suggested the cops too. And I don't know what Marcus wants, just for her to give it up entirely, as if like she could even do that. Move on. But anyway, she ignores them and she asks him to print this photo. And then we see Harper just broken into Dan's house. Or maybe I should call it Freddie's house. But he... (laughs) The Atari is still on from when Kirby woke up hours ago. That noise would drive me nuts. Harper. I feel like Atari is like really focused on in this episode. I don't know if that's to set the scene or if there's more to that. I feel like it's just nostalgia. If I made a movie of my childhood, I would have things like that focused on too. I'm not that old, actually. Atari is my brother. <laughs> um, all right. So he Harper's uh, just like snooping through his house. He looks at a paper regarding custody and the picture of the family, and he turns the book sideways, which we talked about. And Harper hears steps and sees Freddie getting something out of his book bag. So I guess he didn't know that he was home. And he looks surprised, but not alarmed enough to leave. Back about his business, opens the fridge, and all the photos of the victims fall, which is a pretty big reveal for him because he has no idea that anybody's ever been onto him or anything. And he has this like big swallow you can see in his neck. See when when I when he found those photos, I thought maybe something would change for him because in the last episode when he read in the newspaper, his cup changed and this oh, yeah. really the like the huge. music yeah the music was like um, really strange and um, I thought maybe last episode it was maybe his mood can uh, like the, re- yeah affect the reality. time realities. But I think that's wrong now because obviously seeing those photos, he would be alarmed, right? Yeah, it's a big deal. Um, and and nothing, nothing changed. Nothing. I didn't notice anything change. All right. I did. After I, um, when I was watching it the second time, I was a bit confused. So I wrote a tiny little timeline. I just wrote, Kirby stays over and she puts the pictures on the fridge and then Dan doesn't come home because he's out, you know, snorting coke and stuff. Uh-huh. <laughs> then Harper goes to the house that morning and he messes with the books and then he finds Kirby's, the, you know, the pictures that she's put on the fridge. And then Dan comes home 
after his night out and that's when he finds the books. Right. And then I wrote a note, it's all over the fucking place. <laughs> <laughs> that's, your, it, that's your summary, your conclusion? Yes. Yes, it jumps around a lot and I had to write it down just to make sure that I wasn't going insane. Yeah, no, same. I had like a Monday through Friday trying to figure it out. I think when she approaches Jenny, maybe it's a Friday because she says, come back next week. We show the same show. Like, Anyway, we'll get there though. Okay, so um, Harper storms out of the, he drops the photos to the ground and storms out the door and he's clearly angry. Um, so Freddie comes down thinking it's Dan and that's the end of that scene and Dan then you see Dan coming and telling Kirby that Abby that he told Abby that she was the source and that there was no world in which they could publish the article without telling Abby that Kirby's worried she's mad and he says that she got over it but that Kirby needs to be in the story her assault her recovery her tracking down the other victims Kirby's like if I do that the cops will leak my name because they don't like me and they know it's me and he's like, so what? You face the firing squad. You can continually repeat that they've been failing these women. He has a good point. Uh, and she says, but you've seen the book. And she tells him a little more about the problem. When I woke up at your house, I didn't know if I'd been there for one night or five years. Nobody, nobody should listen to me. Uh, and I would be nervous about that too, because people, if she does come out as the source, like people are going to question the shit out of her. And she can't even answer if she was married at the time or you know mm. simple things like that but I like the moment when he said to her when he was explaining to her why it makes sense to uh, include her in the article mm -hmm. he said no one could forget you and Kirby reacts in a way that um, I don't know I see it as her she probably learned to avoid any kind of attachment because she knew um, her reality might change any right. moment and people she built rela relationships with were be gone and I kind of saw her reaction as kind of cracking that in her uh, way of avoiding relationship because yeah. it was something very personal and no one could forget you yeah because she, she's also kind of invisible everywhere yes, she is. She, I was gonna say I think she feels forgotten too like just yeah. be her name. even the police don't care about her so I think the fact, and her, even her own husband kind of seems over it. So the fact that Dan sees her and tells her, no one's going to forget about you. I think that like cracks her hard shell. Yeah. 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 Agreed. And I think Lizzie played this very well, this yeah. moment of, okay, <laughs> someone is fucking it. taking me seriously. And, yeah. and, and then this emotional shift of okay i can really trust him and means a lot yeah exactly um then kirby uh, is back at her desk and she finds the pictures on the desk that marcus printed for her and it's an up close of what they left in the woman's stomach which we can see now are the keys from the adler planetarium so Janice. she goes there and shows the picture to the security guard and asks if they keep records of who the key would be assigned to and the security guard gets a little snippy and says she wants the keys back and then kirby's like holy shit she's still alive she still works here so Jenny is still alive at this moment, we find out, which is surprising. She's coincidentally talking about a very relevant topic as she walks in. Um, she says, pulsars are stars that grow so big they collapse in on themselves. They die in a massive explosion. But when it finally burns out, the pulsar isn't gone. A small part of it is left behind. These stars survive their own deaths. They still emit light. They still have a gravitational pull. They're still with us. So kind of like Kirby. Exactly. Yeah. I'm and wondering that's what I, about the part of where it says a small part is left behind. These stars survive their own death. They still emit light. So I'm wondering how that's going to work and if that's relevant to any of these dead people. When they say a small part is left behind, it makes me think these keys are significant because Jenny is saying, oh, I just got these keys last week or whatever. And when Kirby shows her the picture, she's like, this is from 1972. So it seems almost like these items, I guess, that are being left in them are connecting the victims somehow. Yeah. I kind of, uh, it's the, yeah. uh, the star analogy with Kirby and being the natural death star. Uh, and I was thinking that Harper maybe sees this, these women as um, stars they are growing so big that they're going to collapse on themselves one day. Mm -hmm. And he wants to prevent that. 
-hmm. He doesn't want them to collapse under themselves and something of them to stay behind, like the white dwarf. He wants to extinguish them completely. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I think it ties into the shining girls concept yeah. too. Like yeah. he's, it's like, again, with the girl in the store where it's like, it's growing. Like she's not, she's not bright enough yet, you know? Yeah. Uh, then we flash to Marcus approaching Dan in the office, 9, 10 PM. And he is not being very, very nice, which is funny because didn't when Kirby was asking initially uh, Dan, what he thought of Marcus, like, she said i think she said uh i think he's kind or nice or something anyway yeah not being particularly kind or nice right now and he says when i first shot for you i bought your whole vibe anarchy leads to the truth or whatever it is you're doing abby's kind she gave you a desk when nobody else would and you disappoint people in the name of something bigger but there's never anything bigger all you do is let people down don't let my wife be one of those people yeah that was not kind or compassionate so i think dan was was right about him but i also have a problem i hate the whole my wife thing it's become a massive pet peeve of mine when somebody <laughs> calls somebody else my wife if you know their name like i i don't know on the podcast i say my husband sometimes because i'm talking to a bunch of strangers i don't know um but if you know the person's name and you still if you both know the person's name and you still say like my wife or my husband like it really bugs me it's like an ownership thing you know that reminded me of Seinfeld. What, have you I seen, don't, I've seen, have you seen Seinfeld, Seinfeld, but I don't know that one. Yeah. There's, an, there's an episode where um, she's, there's a woman that says, my fiancé, where is my fiancé gone? <laughs> and then that's when um, Elaine says, what did she say? The, Maybe the a dingo in your Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I don't know why. That just reminded me of that. My fiancé. Hey. Do you, do you have a pet dingo? I've never asked. No, I don't oh. have a pet dingo or a pet crocodile or a pet kangaroo. Koala? Koala? No, I would, I would love a, king, a koala. Though. They're so cute. So I don't remember where we were. Dingoes, dingoes. Where's dingoes in my notes? Uh, my wife. Yes, thank you. All right. <laughs> so Dan doesn't take that very well. And this is when he gets up and storms out to the bar all by himself getting super drunk um yep. and doing cocaine and he's just like oh so gross it's painful. nice dancing skills though you know like yeah. the ones I like where the he's... russian one <laughs> yeah when he's uh, when he's what he's like um bending down or something like doing a squat and he's yeah like... yeah <laughs> he can fiddler in the roof i like that one too <laughs> And he's like breaking things, annoying people, acting insane. And it's just a real mess. And we see Harper watching him, not drinking, just watching him. Oh, and then we, Kirby approaches Jenny after the show. And that's when I, I said, I think it might be Friday because Jenny tells her to come back next week. And they play the show every day. Kirby shows her a picture of the keys and Jenny asks why she took a photo, which I like, that's a reasonable question. It is weird. Uh, she tells her though that nobody got lockers until this year. So there was no locker before her. There was no lockers in 1972. And Kirby starts like shouting the names of her, trying to figure out if she knows any of the other victims. And then she realizes her hair has just grown and she looks in the door and sees it. Is that a good sign? I guess she sees Well, she sees it. that big red ball, which I'm assuming is the sun. Which, <laughs> yeah, that's what she hair. was looking at. Her hair changed. Yeah. So again, Did you I notice like the that... music? The music was the same music as when uh, Harper's uh, cup changed. Mm. Oh, interesting. She's okay. looking at that big glowing red ball. Okay. And yeah. I feel like that ties into like the, the presentation that Jenny was giving with the stars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also think she took on a little more personality after her hair grew. I mean, she only said like a sentence or two afterwards, but <laughs> she seemed to have uh, more personality. And because yeah, she like was um, living in the shadows in the last couple of years and hiding mm -hmm. uh, her trauma. And now she's speaking about it yeah uh so maybe this gives her confidence and I, I thought she was very confident when they were at the police archive and um she just started handing out files to dan mm -hmm. and telling him what to do yeah. so i think the the farther she gets with her investigation the more spark she gets yeah that makes it's sense. almost it's almost like she was dull and now she's getting shiny yes there you go <laughs> There you almost, go. <laughs> almost. Like do you it. do you guys think that um, because obviously 
it flashes forward in the first episode when Ginny dies. We obviously don't know how far in advance it is to now, but do you think um, he kills her or possibly kills her because she's maybe in future episodes Kirby interacts with her more? Like, because obviously she's killed in the future, so maybe Harper. I don't know. I just feel like it's related somehow. Yeah. I mean, it could be because, well, we'll talk about it next, but he seemed shocked that Kirby was alive or that somebody could have been alive. Somebody was, yeah. I wonder if there are any clues to date to the date in her, in Ginny's, like, episode one scenes. Did you look at that, Kimberly? We only see mm-hmm. Harper looking at the party. They have a party at the planetarium. Uh-huh. Yeah, and Jeannie is uh, in fancy clothes, so I think this is probably the shine, a moment to take away right. her shine because she probably discovered something. Yeah, yeah, and that guy pulls her away. Yeah, but the, the grass is green, and Harper's wearing the same clothes. The people are uh, in light clothes outside, so uh-huh. it's not like winter time. So right. when in the future, in the future, I don't think it's very far in the future that she gets killed. Yeah. <laughs> and if um, Harper yeah, she, is now um, shadowing Dan a little, yeah. he'll probably see yeah. Kirby, Kirby and, and I remember if Kirby, her. I wonder if Kirby can stop Jenny's death. I don't know. It's a lot to try and think about. And then uh, Dan's falling down the escalator. Jesus, he's like such a mess. It's really hard to watch. Harper, <laughs> uh, Harper, just leave him alone, and, and Dan will take care of himself. But I must uh, say, I feel like for as much as Dan has just consumed. He seems a lot more coherent than he should. Yeah, he should be yeah. dead. You're right. <laughs> Maybe it was the amount of coke that was the coke perfect. Just sober you up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the amount of alcohol that he got the consumed. ratio down. Yeah, there. Yeah, he, he's a pro, right? At this, <laughs> or his tolerance is just that impressively high. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably both. And they're yeah. they are uh, both wearing the same jacket again. Not the exact same, same color. And he fell, he falls off the escalator under the glass. And now we see why he's bleeding in the beginning of the episode. So the beginning of the episode happened after the end. He's an excellent drunk. I think he's such a good actor. I love it. Abner's love- excellent, I think. He's- it's the first thing, uh, first thing I've seen with him and I'm blown away. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. So- I watched him in Narcos, but um, yeah. he looks a bit different. <laughs> he looks so different. He must have gained yeah. so much weight for Narcos. He plays Pablo Escobar. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he's so good. I just really love him. Yeah, after this too, uh, I love how he tries to use like the liquor paper bag to clean up his bloody hand because exactly <laughs> what his person would do. And Harper is grilling him on the murder, trying to get information, and ask what he knows about him. And Dan does notice that this is strange and stops, and he's like, "Why do you care so much?" And I like that he was um, aware enough to notice that this is weird. Claims it's because a woman was killed four blocks from my house. And he's worried about his son. Dan asks who's taking care of his kid. And Harper digs at him again and says, he's with my ex. I would never leave him on his own. That's that actually, was a jab. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm sure uh, he hates himself. Uh, Dan says, your son is not his type. And Harper says, uh, so it wasn't just Julia. There was more than one. Did a cop tell you that? He's just trying to get info. Okay. He seems shocked that, that somebody even has looked into this more than Julia, like further than her. Right. And Dan says, what do they ever know about cops? And he says, well, how can you be so sure? And Dan says, she said he was the same. Like he, he like fully trusts and believes um, Kirby so much that that's his answer to this like question. I think that's really nice. It says a lot. Um, and then that's where you're getting all this. Did, did some woman survive? Um, so he didn't know that Kirby had survived, which- He seemed really like jarred by that. Yeah. Like the fact that somebody could have actually survived and I mean he did like remove her intestines and such. So I think it's mean, fair to be surprised yeah. that she survived. But yeah, he did. He was totally shocked. Yeah. Because the, the look ahead. on his face was just pure shock. He didn't even consider that that could happen, you know. Right. And we see him uh read the paper all the time. So he probably tracks articles about his victims so they must have um, told in an article that, that she I died think, i think we can say this now but in the book they did they wrote an article that said that she had died i believe so do you guys think he would have killed him right then if he had not needed to find out who was still alive more information from him i have a feeling that 
because yeah he could have just killed him but i have a feeling that maybe he's gonna need him yeah yeah i think, I yeah. think he needs to find out more right now um, yeah before he can kill him i don't think he has any desire for dan to live much longer but he wants more information first and i yeah. think it was uh, a little power play on uh, harper's part to make dan believe he was about to stumble over and he rescued him uh-huh. when so in he- reality he kind of pushed him and then pulled him back that's what i was trying to figure yeah. out okay yeah so he did push him a little i yeah. think he did okay. i think he did too i couldn't figure out if it was either he'd been on this day before but that wouldn't make any sense because then he didn't no. know about kirby and he knew he was gonna fall but yeah you're right and it must be because his hand was up there all right do you guys have any other notes i have a question sure why do you think the uh timeline in the third episode is the circular one why it's not chronological as in the first two do you think it's going to be like the small stuff that happened to kirby are going to start happening for the viewer as well i like But the it's idea so- that it's happening to like the viewers now you know that we're feeling i remember uh, uh watching uh an interview with elizabeth with lizzie and i think she mentions uh that what they wanted to do is put the viewer in a similar situation uh Kirby finds herself in so you're not giving a thread that you follow but you're going to be thrown around and the reality of the show is going to shift as well as the reality of Kirby of Kirby so it's like double shifting so that the the viewer is uh unsettled as well or I don't know destabilized or just feeling like a victim of trauma I like that it's effective yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) and I think in the next episode it's going to be even more complicated until oh, we get seriously? to the big to the big thing <laughs> these are the little things that are happening right now more complicated and... just done instead of two times watching it i have to watch it like three yeah. well, every uh, episode we have to watch it one more time yeah i also uh, noticed uh, kirby's outfits changing um during the three episodes she starts grungy and chucks and t-shirts and the the black cardigan But in the third episode, she has a button-down shirt and a jacket and Doc Martens. I don't like that look on her. (laughs) I literally hate that outfit. I I hate it too. (laughs) But I think it's going to play some role later that Uh her outfits are also shifting and changing. Did she wear this outfit only when she started with Marcus, being married to Marcus? Was it? Uh, it It's Marcus's fault? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah Lizzie did say in an interview that the wardrobe helped her like it's it's significant and she said it helped put her in certain mindsets okay I think that is a wrap on our discussion of Shining Girls episode three thank you for listening and come back next Tuesday for our episode four discussion and if you're a Handmaid's Tale fan Monday will be our spoiler free of season two, episode nine. And Wednesday will be the deep dive into season two, episode nine. Okay. I hope I got all those right. Bye. 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 <laughs>